namo bhagavate vasudevaya aham gatir gati matam kala kala yatam aham gunanam chapyaham samyam Gunin yod patikho gunaha. I am the ultimate goal of all those seeking progress, and I am time among those who exert control. I am the equilibrium of the modes of material nature, and I am natural virtue among the pious. Among things possessing qualities, I am the primary manifestation of nature. And among great things, I am the total material creation. Among subtle things, I am the spirit soul. And of things that are difficult to conquer, I am the mind. Among the Vedas, I am their original teacher, Lord Brahma. And of all mantras, I am the three-lettered Omkara. Among letters, I am the first letter, A. And among sacred meters, I am the Gayatri Mantra. Among the demigods, I am Indra. And among the Basus, I am Agni, the god of fire. I am Vishnu among the sons of Aditi. And among the Rudras, I am Lord Shiva. Among saintly Brahmins, I am Bhrigu Muni. And I am Manu among saintly kings. I am Narada Muni among saintly demigods. And I am Kamadhenu among cows. I am Lord Kapila among perfected beings and Garuda among birds. I am Daksha among the progenitors of mankind and I am Aryama among the forefathers. My dear Uddhava, among the demoniac sons of Diti know me to be Prahlad Maharaj, the saintly lord of the Asuras. Among the stars and herbs, I am their lord, Chandra, the moon. And among yakshas and rakshashas, I am the lord of wealth, Kuvera. I am Airavata among lordly elephants, and among aquatics, I am Varuna the Lord of the Seas. Among all things that heat and illuminate, I am the sun. And among human beings, I am the king. Purport. It is significant to know that Lord Krishna is represented within this universe by the Lord or Supreme in all categories. No one can be as aristocratic and perfect as Sri Krishna, nor can anyone estimate the glories of Sri Krishna. Lord Krishna is without doubt the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Haribo. I'm very grateful to be with you on this Sunday morning. Outside is the annual marathon. I was just thinking in Sanskrit, the word Mara means death. 
also in this world, everyone is trying to run from death. <laughs> that is marathon. <laughs> but you cannot run from death. Because by the power of time, it's, we're actually running toward death. By the power of time. Ayur Harati Vaipung Sam, the Bhagavatam tells, no matter how fast we run, even if we have very fast cars, airplanes, supersonic rocket ships, with every moment we're running toward death. But for one who utilizes their time for self-realization, to hear and chant about the supremely purifying glories of the Supreme, with every rising and setting of the sun, with every moment, we are running toward eternal life. So in that sense, coming to Srimad Bhagavatam classes, a marathon. <laughs> we are running toward eternality. Sorry about that. <laughs> Today we are reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 11, Chapter 16, entitled The Lord's Opulence. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna tells, Janma karma chame divyam evam yoveti tattvata. One who understands the transcendental nature of my appearance and activities never takes birth again in this material world, but attains my abode. Divya means everything about Krishna is transcendental to this material existence. Ishwara Paramakrishna Satchit Ananda Vigra. And Krishna's form is eternal, full of knowledge and full of ecstasy, Ananda. Navayovanamcha, he's ever youthful. Time is under the control of Krishna. Everyone and everything within the entire creation is under the control of time. By the power of time, the sun will burn out. Every ocean will evaporate. The mountains will become dust. The planets will cease to exist. And what to speak of these little bodies we call ourselves. But Krishna is the controller of time. Mayadhyakshena prakriti suyate sacharachara. So why, both in Bhagavad Gita and here in the Uddhava Gita, the 11th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, is Krishna. Why is Krishna, the original supreme personality of Godhead, teaching us to remember him in these apparently material forms? Krishna tells in Gita of fish, I am the shark. He's saying here of illuminating, of illuminators, I am the sun, I am the moon. In this way, Krishna's teaching the spiritual truth that is all pervading everywhere. Because in fact, nothing is material. 
This entire creation, Varasya Shaktir Vavadaiva Shruyate, is the energy of the Supreme. Om Purnam Ata Purnam Idam. The absolute truth is perfect and complete. And everything emanating from the absolute truth is also perfect and complete. Just like the sun in the sky is full of light. And therefore, the sunlight that is emanating from the sun is also full of light. It has the same quality as the sun. It's not different than the sun. It's not the sun, but it is the sun. It's a chintya beta beta, simultaneous inconceivable oneness and difference. It's the key to understanding the mysteries of the material and spiritual realms. Darkness never comes out of the sun. Only light and heat comes out of the sun. So similarly, only spiritual truth, only pure existence can come from Krishna, from God, because he's pure spiritual truth. So what is material? If you turn your head away from the sun, then you see a shadow. The sun, the shadow is simply the absence of the sun. But at the same time, there can't be a shadow without the sun. Are you confused? I am, actually. <laughs> Somehow I've got myself into this state. I have to keep going. But this, the shadow is completely dependent on the sun, but the, sha that the shadow is not coming from the sun. It's due to ourselves turning away from the sun. When you're looking at the sun, you can't, there's no darkness, there's no shadow. So similarly, the concept of material is only a disconnection of our awareness, or in other words, forgetfulness of how everything is God's spiritual energy. And it's manifested in various ways. So Krishna is showing how everything really is spiritual. When Krishna is saying, I am the light and heat of the sun, when Krishna says, I am the ability in man, he's speaking not just figuratively, but literally. Janmadya shayataha. Everything emanates from the absolute truth. the intelligence of the intelligent. He says, of elephants, I am Airavata. Now what does Airavata have to do with God? Just a big elephant. Because he's the best elephant. <laughs> he's Indra's elephant. So the elements that the elephant is made out of, the elements of everything in this world, Krishna says, are my energies. Earth, water, fire, air, ether, the mind, the intelligence, the ego. They're all Krishna's energy. They're all coming from Krishna. They're all non-different than Krishna in that way. So Krishna is teaching us the best of everything is Krishna. The best of fish, the best of elephants, because whatever strength the elephant has, Airavata, is coming from Krishna. Whatever beauty he may have is coming from Krishna. The life force within that gives life is part and parcel of Krishna. 
Krishna tells in Bhagavad Gita, for one who sees me everywhere and everything in me, for that person I'm never lost, nor are they ever lost to me. So Krishna speaking literally in every one of these symbolic analogies, that Krishna is everything. And he's teaching us how to remember him how to be aware of his presence in everything. And when we are in that state of consciousness, then the material world is actually transformed into the spiritual world. Because applied philosophy is the system by which realization takes place just to know things, theoretically, intellectually. There's no transformation of heart. There's no real transformation of our experience of life. Jnana Vigyana, Triptatma. Realizations come when we apply the knowledge to our everyday life. So when we understand Sarva Loka Maheshwaram, everything is God's property. Subtle and gross. Whatever abilities, whatever intelligence, whatever chemical compositions are, make up the different things that we may have, everything is God's energy. So how to apply that knowledge to our life? To use everything in a spirit of seva. <clears throat> People speak about seva in very loose ways. Seva means to serve. You know, if you have a little cut, I give you a Band-Aid. I'm doing seva. <laughs> it's good. Band-Aids are good. If you have cuts. But this idea of seva is the deepest, the deepest conception. What seva really means is our mind, our thoughts, our power of speech, our words, our physical abilities and our actions, whatever we have. They are all being utilized in harmony with our and their relationship with the Supreme. Srila Prabhupada gave many times a simple analogy because when he would be giving these analogies, he would be speaking in a microphone. So is this microphone material or spiritual? If it's spoken, you know, for a political speech. For the purpose of gaining power and influence over others. And it's material. Our perception of it and our utilization of it is material. But the same microphone, when it is used to uplift people's consciousness, to permeate the atmosphere with the divine loving words and pastimes of the Supreme, then we're actually recognizing the spiritual potential in the microphone, and the microphone is then being utilized according to its truth, because it is spiritual. Now we may think that material means temporary and spiritual means eternal. So this microphone's not eternal. This body of mine is not eternal. The money we have is definitely not eternal. <laughs> it comes and it goes. So how are these things spiritual if they're temporary? They're subject to deterioration, old age, disease, death. But the actual but actually nothing dies. The energy 
prakriti is forever. It's just the various manifestations of them that are always changing. So when we understand the underlying spiritual current that composes everything, then we understand how everything, it is eternal when it is recognized and utilized for an eternal purpose. Because at the core of reality, everything is eternal. It's just the manifestations of the shapes and forms that are changing. So Krishna here is telling us, I am Airavata. I am among the aquatics, Varuna. I'm, I'm saintly Brahmins. I am Brigu. Among kings, I am Manu. Among saintly demigods, I'm Narada. I'm Kamadenu among cows. I'm Prahlad among the Daityas. How to see Krishna in everything? Because ultimately, everything is Krishna's energy. Every living being is part and parcel of Krishna. Every living being by constitutional nature is a loving servant of Krishna. Just, the, just like the analogy of the sun, a sun ray is the sun, but the sun ray is always subordinate to the sun. Nityo nityanam chetanas chetananam eko bahunam yogadadati kaman. The Upanishad tells in a similar way there is one supreme eternal and there are limitless eternals. We are those limitless eternals. The limitless eternals are all eternal just like the one supreme eternal, but there's a difference. We are all subordinate to the one supreme eternal. And that subordination is beautiful. Yesterday we were at a house where we were in a particular room. They kept that living room pretty much the same as it was in the 1930s and 40s. And in that room, a handful of men, Gandhi, um, Mr. Patel, Nehru, Jinnah, they all gather together, G.D. Birla, to discuss, we must liberate ourselves from subordination to the British. British Empire was huge, powerful. They controlled India for all, about 200 years. And these people are discussing Quit India, quit Britain. We are going to get liberation. Somehow or other, it worked. Because in this world, people don't like to be subordinate. Why is that? Because when we're subordinate, we're usually exploited. We're controlled. People's thirst for power for wealth, for control. So subordination into this world, in this world, kind of means losing. So it's a very, very um, negative word, being subordinate. But in the spiritual sense, it's the most beautiful idea there is. Because Samoham Sarva Bhuteshu, Krishna tells, I don't envy anyone. He's the Supreme Mother, the Supreme Father. Because 
The Lord is Aishwaryasya Samagrasya, supremely beautiful, supremely knowledgeable, supremely wealthy, supremely famous, supremely renounced. And everything is based on infinite love for all of us. So to be subordinate to God's love is the highest extreme of liberation. Because as we see, India got liberated from Britain, but not too many people are happy about it. We're happy that we're liberated from Britain, but still so many problems, so much pollution, so much disease. <clears throat> In the politics in New Delhi, not everyone's dancing and singing together. So many struggles, so many power plays, still everyone's dying. So liberation in this world is not a solution. May make things temporarily a little more livable. But subordination to Krishna's love is the ultimate liberation. Because to love means to serve, to serve selflessly, without selfishness, without arrogance. <clears throat> And in that love, the Supreme reciprocates by accepting a role of being subordinate to the love of his devotee. Try to think of that. Can you imagine the sun planet accepting the role of being subordinate to a single tiny little molecular sun ray? Does that make sense? Is the sun planet ever subordinate to the sun ray? It's impossible, it's inconceivable. But a chintya shakti, Krishna's powers are inconceivable. <clears throat> That's the nature of love, of prema. That Krishna, the Supreme Sun, the source of everything that exists, the so source of all souls, accepts the role of being subordinate to the love that is dormant within our hearts when it is awakened. So a devotee is always feeling subordinate to the love of God, and, a, and God is takes the greatest pleasure in feeling subordinate to the love of his devotee. And that is called lila, pastimes. Again, lila doesn't just mean playing games and things. The idea of lila, like the concept of seva, is so profoundly deep that it can never be described appropriately in words because it's beyond. Leela is that completely transcendent, inconceivable, ecstatic reciprocation of love that's expressed through words, through actions. In the spiritual world, and where there's the awakening of this bhakti or love, it is not different than the spiritual love in the spiritual world, in the material world. In the Brihad Bhagavata Amrita by Srila Sanatan Goswami, there's a wonderful story of a simple boy 
His name is Gopa Kumar. And he's born to a family that just takes care of cows. He's a cowherd boy, Gopa. He was born and raised at Govardhan, in a simple village near Brindavan. And Gopa Kumar, he's so simple. But he has this deep longing to fulfill what everyone wants to fulfill, our desire for satisfaction. Have you ever met or seen anyone that's not trying to be satisfied? According to the modes of nature that we're influenced by, we're trying to seek our satisfaction in different things. The kind of music we listen to, the kind of dress we wear, the kind of entertainment, the kind of people we associate with, what we study in school, what we're, how we're trying to earn our money. Everyone's looking for satisfaction. And we're all trying to avoid pain. Why? Why do we all have this in common? Even little ant, you just go touch an ant and he'll run away because he doesn't want pain. The ant doesn't have a PhD. But if you touch a PhD, the same, a, PH, a person who has six PhDs, they're trying to avoid pain just like the ant because it's the intrinsic nature of life. We don't want pain. Because pain interferes with our quest for satisfaction. Ultimately, it's not a negative thing, it's a positive thing. We're all looking for satisfaction and we are all trying to avoid that which interferes our, with our satisfaction. That's life. That's the reality. That's the motivating force for everyone and everything. But there's only one thing that satisfies the heart and the soul. To love and to be loved. Seva, Lila, is the highest, fullest, purest expression of that love. The love of the soul for Krishna. So Gopa Kumar was looking for that love. And sometimes, you know, we're, we don't recognize what we already have. He's living at Govardhan. But Govardhan seems to be a very ordinary place sometimes. If, we, if we're not really recognizing, we need the association of people who see to give us the eyes to see. Srila Prabhupada would sometimes say, it, uh, a saintly person doesn't just see with their eyes, they see with their ears. We understand the truth of things at the beginning through, through knowledge. And then when we apply that knowledge, then we could actually see with our eyes because things are revealed. So he, Gopal Kumar was seeking that love, seeking that satisfaction, seeking something that was there in his heart. And he traveled everywhere. And he, he met a great saintly person who gave him a mantra, a Gopal mantra. And by the chanting of this mantra, he could, he could go anywhere. Brihad Bhagavatam Rita, the second part, describes how he was going everywhere trying to find the trying to discover the fulfillment of that love he was seeking 
and he was actually experiencing everything that people in this world are striving for. He had it, but he wasn't satisfied. He was attaining everything the greatest yogis who have supernatural, mystical, magical powers. Even after attaining those things, he was still searching for something more. He achieved mukti, liberation, into the eternal, everlasting light of Brahman. But still something more he was seeking. He entered into Vaikuntha, the spiritual world, the eternal planets where the Lord is personally living with his eternal associates forever. <clears throat> where there's only anand, ecstasy, nothing else exists. He was looking for something more. Beyond Vaikuntha, he went to Ayodhya from the abode of Narayan to the abode of Lord Sri Ramchandra, his eternal abode. Still, then he went to Dwarka, Krishna's abode, the Dwarka of Vaikuntha, not in this world, but in the spiritual world. And in Dwarka, the royalty, the aishwarya, the opulence, the majesty of that place is inconceivable. There's no anxiety. Everything is eternal, full of knowledge and full of bliss. And everyone is directly a relative of Krishna, who's Dwarka Dish. So Gopa Kumar, he's still, wherever he went, he was the same. He's just, he's going through all these heavenly places and Vaikuntha places, and now he's in Dwarka. And he goes into the Sudharma the assembly house where Krishna's meeting with all Ugrasena and the Pandavas and various, the, the most celebrated persons in their eternal forms. And he's, he's thinking himself so insignificant, so small, he's just wearing the little rags of a cowherd boy. And he's with the most royal princes and kings and queens and princesses. And they're all with Krishna. And when Krishna sees him, Krishna, Krishna remembers his pastimes in Brindaban and Govardhan. And he starts to cry, feeling separation from his pastimes in Brindaban. His pastimes in Brindaban are simultaneously going on, but still, he's eternally there as Dwarkadish, but he's remembering his pastimes in Brindaban. And even though everyone is there, all Krishna's Yadu family, Krishna takes Gopakumar, takes him by the hand, and leaves everybody else to go with him. And he, Krishna sends, he didn't say anything, but Uddhava, who we are reading about today, because this is the Uddhava Gita, Krishna speaking to Uddhava. Uddhava was such a dear friend of Krishna. Uddhava was most learned scholar, disciple of Brihaspati. He was Krishna's own cousin, but also he was best friend. And all the residents of Dwarka, including Ugrasena, they all 
loved Uddhava so much. When you love Krishna, you love everyone. That's the secret formula of love. If I love this person and that person, then probably I don't love other people. But if you love Krishna, you love everyone. What's the difference? The difference is, if I love my friend or my relative, not everything that exists is coming from that person. So when I love that person, I'm distracted from loving other people. But when we love God, because everything's coming from God, when you love God, it includes everything and everyone. Universal love is just the natural quality. As the Srimad Bhagavatam explains, when you pour water on the root of a tree, that water extends to every part of the tree, the leaves, the twigs, the branches, the flowers. And similarly, when you put food in the stomach, it naturally goes to every cell of your body, the energy and the nutrients. So when we place our propensity to love in the supreme object of love, and the supreme lover, it includes everyone. We see that everyone is a part of Krishna. We see that everything is the energy of Krishna. That's a higher liberation than just being at peace. It's a higher experience than just not being disturbed. But there's so much disturbance in this world, sometimes we're thinking the highest liberation is to not be disturbed. Yes. Sometimes we have health issues. Sometimes we're constipated. And the highest liberation is just to respond to nature's call. <laughs> but that's not the highest liberation. <laughs> it seems that way when, you're, when, you, when you can't think about anything else. But the most inclusive experience of happiness is not just to be peaceful. It's not just to be um, without anxieties. That is a huge liberation compared to the condition most of us, most of us are in, in this world. But, but beyond that, is to actually express the unending, infinite, ecstatic love of the soul toward Krishna everywhere and in everything and everyone. So Uddhava was Krishna's dearest friend. And Uddhava understood Krishna's heart, that he wants me to take Gopakumar to live in my house with me. Why? Because Uddhava, he understood the Brijabhasis. He understood the nature of the love of Brindaban. So Uddhav took Gopakumar, they lived in his home together, and every day they would go to see Krishna so many times. And whenever they would go into the Sudharma to meet Krishna, there would be limitless people. Krishna's sons, Krishna's daughters, Krishna's, all the Pandavas and all the great kings from all these other eternal associates of the Lord. And one day, some of the citizens of the Yadu dynasty, because they're speaking from their own realizations. And what's interesting here is these are 
self-realized souls. These are paramhamsas. These are people who are beyond liberation, beyond vaikuntha. These are people who have awakened their pure ecstatic love for God eternally. These are people whose bodies are not getting old. These are people who are beyond old age, disease, and death, who have pure spiritual bodies. But they have the natural quality of their love for Krishna. So they take Gopakumar aside and say, you know, why you're wearing these raggedy little clothes that, you know, people wear when they're just out with cows? Look at all the people in Dwarka. Nobody dresses like this. Everyone is adorned with the most elegant dresses and jewels. They said, you should dress like us. You're in Dwarka now. There's no reason for you to be in such a pathetic state. Because to them, it's pathetic. And they offered all these wonderful clothes to Gopakumar, Kumar. But it just wasn't him. He just didn't fit in that. He just kept wearing his ragged old cowherd clothes. <laughs> He didn't have any propensity to wear their clothes. But then a problem happened. The problem was after they brought this to his attention of how different he was from everyone else, then when he would go to meet Krishna, he would see them with their beautiful elegance, and he felt like a misfit. Like, I, I actually, I don't even belong here. And he was thinking of leaving. After going to the spiritual world to be with Krishna, he, want, he wanted to leave, but he couldn't leave. Because even though he didn't really feel that he fit in, everyone loved him. It wasn't like in this world where people were discriminating against him. They were only trying to give him nice clothes. <laughs> because they loved him and they wanted him to be happy because this was their conception of love and happiness. In this world, why do people not like to be poor with rich people? Because there's usually a condescending attitude. I have more than you. But this was not condescending. This, when they were offering him these things, it was pure love and compassion. Because they were in such happiness, being like this, reciprocating with Krishna. Because Krishna was giving them all these things. And they were dressing the best they could to give Krishna satisfaction, and Krishna was dressing the best he could to give them satisfaction. So it was a reciprocation of love, and they were so much swooning in the ecstasy of that love, they wanted to share it with him. That's what they knew. So please, here, you could look so nice for Krishna and for us. But it just didn't work for him. So when he would go in, he was thinking, maybe I, I don't fit, maybe I should leave. But then he would see Krishna, and Krishna would glance upon him with such infinite love. He couldn't leave. So one day, he was at Uddhava's house, and Narada Muni came. Now, Practically everywhere that Gopakumar was going, he would meet Narada Muni. <laughs> he asked Narada Muni, how come I see you everywhere? <laughs> how could you be in so many places? Is it, you're just following me around? <laughs> 
And in this dialogue, so many inner spiritual truths are being revealed. Narada Muni is telling how Krishna is simultaneously one and expanded in so many ways and so many forms. Krishna is to Bhagavan Swaya. That Krishna is the source of all incarnations. And there are limitless incarnations, and they are all existing simultaneously, eternally. Narayan, Narasena, Varaha, Vamana. All these different manifestations, Dwarkadish, Partha Sarathi, Shamsundar, they're all existing eternally in transcendental planets of the spiritual world. And every one of these aspects of Krishna or God is fully aware with all full potencies. But according to the rasas that is being shared with the devotees, is revealing certain aspects. So there's no difference between Ram or Narayan or Narsinga and Krishna. It's just a matter of the intimacy of how that one supreme is reciprocating. And they're existing. And when the Lord manifests himself in various incarnations within the material creation, he's still existing in the spiritual world. And Narada Muni said, and similarly, the, the loving eternal associates of the Lord have that same power by the will of the Lord. They can expand. Narada Muni said, it's not that I'm just jumping from place to place. Wherever you went, I'm there, and I'm here. And what's the difference between me there and me here? There's no difference, but there's a difference. What is the difference? There I'm there and here I'm here. <laughs> Other than that, there's no difference. When Narada Muni was in Krishna's Leela in this world in Dwarka, he went to the different palaces of Krishna. And he saw Krishna was doing different things in each palace. One place he was playing games with his children. Another place he was speaking intimate subjects with his queen. Another place he was speaking, he was discussing some um, subjects of the kingdom with Ugrasena. Another place he was eating with Uddhava. Another place he was taking rest. And Narada Muni was going really fast, one place to another. And Krishna was in every place doing something different with somebody else, simultaneously. And because Krishna is a chintya, inconceivable, Krishna can give the power of his devotee to be the same. When Nanda Maharaj is eternally living in Vaikuntha, in Goloka, but at the same time, wherever Krishna is manifesting in the material world, that, son, that same Nanda Maharaj is there, performing various pastimes. So Narada Muni explained this. And then Gopakumar, he expressed how out of place he felt because he just, it, it was artificial. He didn't have it within his heart to change his identity from a simple little cowherd boy. And yet he was in the royal opulence of Dwarka. And Narada Muni told Uddhava, you should explain to Gopukumar the most intimate, highest sweetness of love, rasa, of Brindaban, and how it includes everything else. Because, Uddhava, you know these things. Krishna revealed them all to you. You went to Brindaban. You experienced the love of Sri Radha, 
the love of Nanda, Yashoda, the gopas, the gopis, the cows, everyone. Tell them the nature, tell, tell him the nature of Goloka. And Uddhava said, but I'm, I'm a Kshatriya and you're a Brahman. How could I speak in your presence? And Narada Muni began to laugh. He said, you're in the spiritual world of Vaikuntha, Dwarka. There's no Varnashram Dharma here. <laughs> you're still thinking you're a Kshatri and I'm a Brahmin? What is this? But since you're thinking that way, I will speak. And then Narada Muni began to explain the glories of the simplicity of Brindavan. How the Brindavan of this world is Gokul, is none different than the Brindavan of the spiritual world. But how the Brindavan of this world, Gokul, in certain ways, Krishna does certain things here that are very attractive that he doesn't do in Goloka. And the residents of Goloka are fully satisfied there. But because the leela of this world that Krishna does, performs, is not different. It's of the same spiritual rasa. The associates of Krishna and Goloka, it's really an adventure to come to, the, to Gokul, to the material world, because Krishna does things here that he doesn't do there. It's not that there's anything incomplete there. It's just variegatedness. Because in Goloka, every tree is Kalpa Briksha. That means every part of the tree, every leaf, every twig, the fruits, the flowers, the bark, the wood, the roots, every single part of the tree has the power of such supreme compassion that could fulfill anyone's desires for the rest of eternity. That's power. Could you imagine having the power to fulfill anyone's desire for the rest of eternity and beyond? What's beyond eternity? Krishna. <laughs> and every part of the tree, that's the power of the tree. You take one little crumbling part of a piece of bark and say, Krishna. <laughs> and that tree can fulfill all your innermost spiritual desires forever. And yet, the trees just appear like ordinary trees. That's the simplicity of Brindavan. The cows, every cow is a Kamadenu. They could do the same thing, but they're just or they just appear to be very ordinary cows. And Krishna in Brindavan, let us say this the gopis. Every gopi in Vrindavan is beyond Mahalakshmi, the supreme goddess of fortune. This is revealed in the scriptures, Brahma Samhita, Srimad Bhagavat. Mahalakshmi is the, the original Lakshmi, the goddess of fortune, the consort of Narayan, the source of all love, the source of all blessings. Indra, Brahma, Shiva, whatever powers they have is only by the grace of Mahalakshmi. Otherwise, they can't give any blessing. Mahalakshmi and her various expansions like Durga, Parvati, 
are the presiding goddess over the entire material creation. They're just partial manifestations of Mahalakshmi. Her power, her love. She's the constant associate of Vishnu. She's residing over his heart forever. She's inseparable. She's his own consort, but yet her favorite place to be is at his feet, where she could render the hum most humble service. And the gopis of Vrindavan are that they are all beyond in their ecstasies, in their love, and in their powers, beyond Mahalakshmi, every gopi. At Bailvan in Vrindavan, there is a place where Mahalakshmi leaves by Kunta because she wants to participate as a gopi in the leela of Krishna. She's willing to leave Vaikuntha to be a simple gopi, to, to exchange these most intimate, simple pastimes with Krishna. And yet the gopis, they're not thinking we have the powers beyond Mahalakshmi. Because it, Vrindavan would be no fun if they were thinking like that. They have that power. But that power is covered. It's not covered like we're covered by Maya. It's covered by their love. They just have such a love to intimately give pleasure to Krishna in, such, in, in the sweetest possible way that in their love they feel themselves to be ordinary. They're milking cows and making garlands. Everything they're doing is the most ordinary little things. At our temple, our, we do these things every day. And anyone can do it. See all these ladies back there making garlands? That's the seva of the gopis. They don't hardly need any training to do it. It's like, <laughs> you, just, you just put the string in it and tie a little thing and then it's a garland. It's very easy. <laughs> if you associate with garland makers, you naturally become a garland maker. To sing, to dance, anyone can do. Little children sing and dance. So the supreme Mahalakshmis, that's what they're doing in Goloka, to give pleasure to Krishna. And Krishna in Vrindavan, the quintessential sweetness of all fullness of love, he's sharing with his devotees and the devotees are sharing with Krishna in Vrindavan. And Narada Muni and Uddhava are in the process in this particular section of Brihad Bhagavatamrita of explaining to Gopa Kumar that you're thinking yourself to be kind of out of place and inferior to these people in Dwarka, but you're limitlessly more dear to Krishna than even them, just as you are. We will continue another time to discuss this wonderful subject. Within this world, Vrindavan, 
is the supreme holy place because it is the place where Krishna is eternally revealing the simplest loving exchanges which are beyond all levels of spiritual realization. And Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he's come to this world because Krishna only reveals the pastimes of Vrindavan to the world once in a day of Brahma. That's over eight billion years. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who is Krishna in the mood of Sri Radha, who's inviting anyone and everyone to actually taste the sweetness of these pastimes. This is the gift Srila Prabhupada has brought to the whole world. The abode of Vrindavan and the eternal loving forms with all the mercy of Sri Radha and Krishna have descended within their names. And if we can appreciate this spirit of seva, if we can appreciate the value of the gift of what we've been given, and we sincerely take shelter of that gift, then through the chanting of the Maha Mantra, through the association of devotees, through making simple sacrifices of service to please the Lord, to please the Lord's devotees, to show kindness to others, then that realization of Vrindavan becomes the everlasting reality within our own hearts. Thank you very much. Question? Yes, Dwarkadish, bro. Hare Krishna. <coughs> uh, Prabhupada used to say <coughs> in the Srimad Bhagavatam that 500 years ago when the Goswamis were there in this world, there were Kalpaviksha trees <coughs> in Vrindavan. And the Goswami stayed under those trees and did fulfill all their spiritual desires. <clears throat> like the one we have at Madan Ter, like the one we have at uh, where Krishna climbed that um, for killing Kaliya, that uh, Kadamba tree, uh, under the one, for example, where Krishna performed the Rasalila, the Pamsi butter tree. <clears throat> so uh, those are sort of recognized by us also as uh, aspirants. These are actual perfect trees from the time they were there. But are other trees also in Braj today? Do we see them as Kalpavisha trees or they are they're, they're regular trees growing out of the ground? <clears throat> when Prabhupada said there were Kalpavisha trees and these are some of the recognized ones endorsed by Acharyas and supported by Shastra. But then what about the other trees? They are like regular trees or is the ground still Chintamani there or is all tar road and everything else? <clears throat> or only the same places where we are untouched by modern man, <clears throat> the deeper parts, like the place we had gone, Brahma Bhivan Leela, where there is actual same dust, which was not touched by man. <clears throat> so, where, how do you understand Vrindavan in the present context? Hare Krishna. <laughs> because it is Vrindavan, even if a tree may appear to be an ordinary tree, 
may obviously many of the trees in Vrindavan today, like many of the people, are not eternal associates who have descended from Goloka. But somehow or other, because they're in the atmosphere of Vrindavan, if we approach the tree with a pure desire and a prayer for loving service to Sri Krishna, then the power of Sri Radharani's grace, Vrindavan Ishwari, can manifest to reciprocate to that tree. That is a special feature of the power of the land of Vrindavan. RG Media YouTube channel. Like, share, subscribe.